Hey everyone, Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, back again for another brief That's Our Two Satoshis Live. For those just dialing in for the first time, this is what we do every week. We review what we wrote about in terms of key drivers of the digital asset industry. All stems from the blog that we write, uh, which you can find at ar.ca backslash blog. Uh, this week we talked about a couple things, right? One, obviously the macroeconomic environment. I think unfortunately or fortunately we can't get away from that right now. Uh, but two, uh, before we get into the macro, really keying in on some of the health factors that we're seeing in the digital asset market. So, you know, I would say that the digital asset market is no stranger to crisis, you know, from Mt. Gox in 2014 to you know, any part of 2018, um, you know, to what we saw uh, uh, in May of 2021. And of course, you know, in the last few weeks here around Terra Luna's implosion and uh, uh, the complete loss of confidence in, in UST and everything in the Terra ecosystem. Um, you know, no stranger, sure, but also, well, you know, when you have a crisis, you know, there's a couple things you have to do, right? First and foremost is you have to stop the bleeding, which I think the digital asset market is, you know, pretty well renowned at this point for um, being able to weather these storms without any real, you know, government help or any real bailouts. But two is you have to rebuild confidence, right? And that's what we stemmed uh, uh, on. And that's what we focused on with the, with the write up last week was. How do you rebuild that confidence, right? As soon as there's a crisis, immediately you hear the same things over and over again, right? That Tether has no backing, that Celsius is going to implode, that Coinbase is going to go bankrupt, you know, you name it, right? Most of the time, this obviously isn't true. Occasionally, you know, there is a real skeleton in the closet, right? From the collapse of cred capital, you know, over a year and a half ago now um, to, you know, what happened with UST. So you have to take this stuff seriously. And what we try to do is get a real health check, right? How do you, how do you figure out if there really are any other dead bodies about to float to the surface that we just haven't seen yet. Um, you know, a famous quote by, by Warren Buffett, right, is, you, you know, you, you find out, uh, uh, you know, who the dead bodies, bodies are when the tide goes out. Um, you know, similarly, you know, why did Bernie Madoff get caught in 2008 and not at any point in the five years prior to that? It's because once asset prices all go down together, it's very hard to hide uh, any any negligence or any malfeasance. So I think people are rightfully on edge right now. You know, is there other problems um, that we need to address. So we spent most of the last couple of weeks trying to figure just that out uh, alone, right? How much of this is just fear, which is rampant, right? Fear and greed indexes are at the lows. Um, all sentiment indicators are at the lows. Cash is all-time highs across all markets. Uh, equities, debt, you know, uh, digital assets as well. Um, you know, in fact, we even quoted uh, our friend Paul Kremsky over at Cumberland, uh, who had a pretty interesting quote over the weekend, just talking about it's embarrassing in polite company to be bullish right now. Um, you know, basically, it's, it's hard to be a bull. If you're a bull and you're pitching internally to your CIO or portfolio manager or you're to your traders, you're getting laughed at. Laughed at. If you put something out there publicly bullish, you're getting laughed at right now, right? There's real career risk in being bullish uh, because of these fears that are out there. Um, you know, so when it gets this lopsided, history generally tells you it's a good time to go contrarian. But in order to do that, you have to rebuild that confidence. You have to be confident that there's nothing else lurking. So, you know, we spent most of the last couple of weeks talking to our counterparties, right? There's a lot of big counterparties in digital assets from your big exchanges, your Coinbase's, your Binance's, your FTX's, to your big OTC dealers, um, you know, your Cumberland's, your B2C2's, your Galaxies, your Genesis, um, to some of the market makers, right? Your, your Alameda's, your Jumps, you know, trying to figure out what's going on with the infrastructure here, right? Is everyone just gonna point fingers at each other talking about who's next to blow up or, or, or are things okay? Um, and what we found is that for the most part, things actually seem pretty healthy. Um, you know, again, that doesn't necessarily mean prices are going to go higher, but it means that, you know, all this thought and, and concern about who's going to blow up next, it's very hard to pinpoint where that's going to come from, right? You know, we've seen stablecoin AUM falling pretty fast, right? USDC has been rising at the expense of uh, DAI, which is part of MakerDAO and uh, uh, USDT, you know, the Tether stablecoin. Um, AUM has been going down because people have been redeeming and those redemption mechanisms have been working fine. Um, but we haven't seen any real vulnerabilities come from that. And, and, and further, um, you know, again, when we talked to all these counterparties, they all basically told us the same thing. They said immediately after the Terra Luna situation happened, um, they started to uh, ping all of their counterparties, right? Funds like ARCA, funds, you know, uh, in the VC world, in the liquid trading world, in the, in the quantitative uh, ARB world. Um, asking them to basically give money. If you have any outstanding uh, uh, margin, if you have any loans outstanding, if you have any negative P&L balances, they basically called you and said, send money. And every single one of these counterparties was able to deliver no problem, right? Apparently there was a lot less leverage in the system than people feared. Um, 
you know, even some of these loans were non-callable loans, but the counterparties called them anyway, just to make sure that their counterparties could, uh, in fact, deliver. So, you know, it's interesting. And I started asking myself, like, well, why? Why, you know, why after a move that big and that fast are so many, you know, dealers and funds and, and everyone else healthy? And I think a lot of it is because the, the, the leverage liquidations on exchanges really do act kind of like a stop loss. Um, you know, just do math for a second. Let's say that I want to risk 1% of my capital on a big trade. Let's just say it's a, you know, Ethereum. Well, I could risk 1% at 10x leverage on an FTX or a Binance futures, um, knowing that if the price of Ethereum goes down by 10%, I'm going to be liquidated. And I'm going to lose that 1% of my capital. That's no different than taking a 10% position in Ethereum and having a stop loss down 1%, right? Uh, or down 10% you lose the exact same amount of money. So ultimately, some of these liquidations that you see that make everyone think that there's so much hidden leverage is really just risk management and prudent risk management as a way to stop the downside rather than just aggressive gambling on the upside. Um, and the other thing I think that's, that's important that a lot of tr especially traditional finance folks don't understand is that um, there are no prime brokers in digital assets. There's no places where you can just have unlimited leverage and an unlimited ability to trade your assets without really having to provide any real collateral. Um, you know, when you look at what happened with Archegos Capital, right, Bill Wang and, and you know, the beginning of 2021, um, where he had all these different stocks that he was levering up at different primes and ultimately blew up and nobody knew about it until it was too late. You can't do that in the digital asset world, right? We settle instantaneously, T plus 10 minutes um, every time there's a trade. Uh, there's just no real way to, in, to build up a lot of leverage at multiple different counterparties without being over collateralized and without being called right away. So, you know, again, it's certainly possible the market will get worse before it gets better. We know the macro headwinds. We know that all the issues that are out there. Um, but, you know, realistically, uh, uh, the, the industry has matured quite a bit in terms of the health of its players and the health of its counterparties. Uh, and I think a lot of these fears that pop up every time there's a market downturn are probably unfounded. Um, so we'll see. You know, we'll probably know in a couple of weeks uh, or so if, if, if what I'm saying is true or not. Um, but at least the channel checks we're doing, uh, we're pretty pleased with the results. Um, I think ironically, and perhaps maybe even coincidentally, um, you know, some of what we're talking about here is really what blockchain solves for, right? I mean, the technology itself is meant to be able to be an on-chain indicator of health, you know, health in a lot of different things from employment credentials to assets um, to anything else you can think of from credit checks and, and, and lending. So, you know, ultimately, a lot of these problems are being solved for right now in the ability of you're not going to have to just call your dealer and trust that they have the assets or do a margin call and hope they can make it. You know, pretty soon we're going to have a lot of uh, on-chain verifications that indicate, you know, whether or not you're a healthy counterparty. So, you know, pretty, uh, I think it'll be a magical day when, when blockchain evidence replaces the rumor mill and we won't have to do this uh, like we've been doing for the last few years. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to end early today. We encourage everybody to go read the blog, ar.ca backslash blog. Uh, my colleague, the great uh, uh, research analyst, Nick Holtz, uh, who's actually graduating from Yale MBA as we speak. Congratulations, Nick. Uh, he wrote an awesome piece talking about what's next on the horizon from a macro standpoint in terms of negative demand shock uh, versus supply shock and, and kind of where we're headed with inflation expectations and ultimately the Fed's path. So I encourage you to read it, um, ask questions, ping us on Twitter or on LinkedIn, um, or at our website, uh, but we'd love to hear from you and get your thoughts. But that's it for That's Our Two Satoshis Live. We'll check in again next week. Thanks, everybody.